So we are extremely lucky today uh, to have all the way from the University of Warsaw, Dagmara Vilgosz Rondolino, who is a lecturer of classical archaeology, but also a specialist in Near Eastern archaeology and archaeometry, and her colleague Pavel. Um, I'm sorry, Pavel. I always get this wrong. Pavel no Nowakowski. Nowakowski. I'm so sorry. I was practicing earlier and I still got it wrong. Um, who is a lecturer in ancient history also at the University of Warsaw. And the two of them are a fantastic tag team who are going to present um, some of the results of a wider project that they have going at the moment uh, called Marmara Asiatica. I'm just going to post for you the link to the website of their project into the chat box. I do encourage you to have a look at it. It's a beautiful website. Um, it's got a fantastic GIS um, interface where you can see everything mapped in fabulous detail. So I do encourage you to have a look at it. But I don't think you should look at it right now because right now I think you should look at your screens and listen uh, to Dagmara and Pavel as they talk to us about the rock inscriptions, graffiti and crosses from a quarry at Guktepe in the Mula district. Over to you, uh, Dagmara first. I will start, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Nisha, and uh, good afternoon to, to everyone. Um, I will briefly present the general outline of the project and uh, I will pass the floor to Pavel, who will go deeper into the discussion on the main subject of our paper. Uh, you can learn more um, about the project from our website. The rock inscriptions and graffiti from Quarry Geo3C in Göktepe were studied as a part of a broader project, Marmora Asiatica, launched in 2013 by then Institute and today Faculty of Archaeology of the University of Warsaw. It was an um, interdisciplinary project intended as an archaeogeological investigation whose goal was to document the main white and gray and black marble quarries of antiquity in Asia Minor. The aim of our study was also to develop an extensive database of mineralogical, petrographic, and uh, geochemical characteristics of the marbles for reliable identification of this material used in ancient artifacts. The long-term research program was financed by the National Science Center of the Republic of Poland and supported by the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Turkey, as well as by the General Directorate of Mineral Research and Exploration of the Republic of Turkey. It was intended as an international collaboration between archaeologists, epigraphists, and geologists from Poland, Turkey, Italy, and United States, and you can see here the, the members of the team listed at the right side of the slide. The joint mission carried out four seasons of survey. The first in 2014 focused on the quarries of ancient Okumeion and of the quarries of Göktepe. In 2015, during the second fieldwork season, the quarries of Aphrodisias and those of the region of Altendash were examined. It, in 2016, we surveyed Proconesus, and finally, in 2017, the quarries located in the territories of Ephesus. The fieldwork consisted of three separate components, systematic geological and archaeological investigation, mapping, and extensive sampling program. With the goal of locating and recording as many quarries as possible, we used the published results of previously conducted fieldworks and the satellite imagery. The mapping of the quarries was done with the total station and GPS equipment, although the most important and useful tool for this kind of documentation was a 3D laser scanner. Um, the scanner allowed us to make accurate three-dimensional models of the single quarry, and you can see some examples here on the slide to document any trace of the human activity and to estimate the volume of stone extracted, revising the knowledge on the quarry's production. During our fieldwork seasons, we documented over 300 individual quarries, of which 100 have never been identified before. But their discovery demonstrates the viability of using uh, extensive survey as a method for locating new quarries and underscores the general fact that not all ancient quarries have been discovered and or documented. 
Importance of our survey and of geological and archaeological documentation, especially 3D scanning, is all the more crucial that much of the evidence for ancient quarries has been lost as a result of extremely ex intensive modern exploitation. Uh, before, before we get to the actual subject of today's talk, the inscriptions and graffiti from the quarries of Göktepe near Mula, which is just a small part of the entire project, I will give a very brief overview of the site. These quarries are located in Caria, some 40 kilometers as the crow flies southwest of Aphrodisias, and were discovered over 15 years ago by Turkish geologists and then explored by Donato Atanasio, Matthias Bruno, and Ali Bahadir Yavuz. The quarries are located in an area densely covered by vegetation situated 900 meters above the sea level. We investigated and documented 20 quarries, 11 of white marble and nine of gray and black marble. They are clustered into four sectors labeled Geo1, Geo2, Geo3, Geo4, after Atanasio, Bruno, and Diabos. Uh, sector Geo1 and Geo2 uh, yield gray and black fine grade marble that uh, sometimes contains yellowish calcitic bands. These bands are often cross-shaped. Next, next slide, please. Also, the rudest fossils are frequent in the black marble. In sectors Geo3, Geo4, fine grade pure white marble was extracted. It is very similar to Carrara marble. According to Atanasio and others, Göktepe quarries were exploited from the beginning of the first century AD with the marble extraction reaching its peak from the Hadranic period onwards. A second peak of activity was suggested for the late Roman period and lasted until the early fifth century. The chronological setting of the quarries was based mainly on the archaeometric analysis of marble sculptures kept in various museums. The question of the quarry's ownership has also been widely disputed in the past. The imperial tenure has been proposed by Matthias Bruno. An important piece of evidence are two rectangular small blocks of dark marble cut with stepped surface inscribed with a Latin inscription which is the name Olympus or Olympus, written as a combination of the letter O and the ligature YLP, followed by the serial number of the stone block. The individual mentioned here was identified by Bruno with a Rationalis of Trajan, known from some blocks found in Fossa Traiana, now kept in Ostia, apparently using the same monogram. His name appeared together with the formula ex ratione and Cesaris and with consular dates. The name is followed by Latin numbers preceded by the letter N for numerus. The imperial ownership of the quarries of Göktepe was postulated also based on two shapeless, roughly worked blocks of white marble from quarry Geo 4B. One of them carries Greek letters, rho epsilon, on one side and a Latin inscription CV on the other side, both producing the number 105. Atop there is a shallow circular depression interpreted as a hole for an imperial seal. The Greek letters rho kappa alpha incised on another block record the number 121. On the basis of this very random epigraphic material, we can only suppose some imperial supervision in the quarrying or dressing process, maybe in relation to special orders where the imperial oversight was short term and limited, rather than as evidence for long term and continuous imperial ownership. The latter seems to be quite exceptional, which has been shown by Alfred Hugh. Most of the quarries were in fact in municipal or private hands. Mixed ownership, private or imperial um, and imperial was proposed by Ben Russell, but also a local ownership is just as likely. It has been suggested that the quarries of Göktepe widely provided marble across the Mediterranean basin, also as the favorite material of the renowned sculptors of the so-called school of Aphrodisias. 
Our volumetric measurements indicate that only approximately 17,000 cubic meters of white marble were extracted in antiquity from 11 quarries of Birktepe and 10,000 cubic meters of gray and black marbles in ancient and modern times from nine quarries. These numbers relate to the gross material and not to the marble used efficiently in the Roman period. It seems therefore reasonable to be cautious about the assumption regarding the extensive use of Gertepe marble in the Roman Empire. The dimensions of the quarries and a modest volume of marble extracted may suggest that they were exploited to meet the local and regional market for nearby cities of Asia Minor. The local use of Gertepe marbles would be more in line with exploitation pattern, uh, patterns in the, in the region. Nearby cities, as Kis, um, Hilarima, Xistis, uh, or even Mobola, might have used the marble for their own sculptural purposes. Of course, we cannot exclude that some load of marble may have reached other provinces and Rome, possibly as special requests by the people or artists in charge of the imperial undertakings. The Gertepe quarries vary from small to medium size, and they were cut directly into the slope of a hill or are small pits without organized quarry phase. However, one quarry differs much in exploitation technique. This is the so-called underground quarry geo 3 c it presents a mixed quarrying system since the white marble layers were covered by carbonate breccia, six to eight meters thick. In the southwestern part of the quarry, marble could be extracted in an open air pit where it was possible to remove the overlaying breccia. Next slide, please. Towards the northeast, white marble had to be extracted in small blocks undercutting the breccia. Accordingly, it was necessary to cut small chambers into the rock and leave pillars or walls to support the undercut breccia. In such chambers, we found rock inscriptions and graffiti. We immediately connected both the particular topography of this quarry and epigraphic material with possibly later occupation of Geo 3C by Hermes, who used the quarried chambers as a dwelling place. This would explain the fact that, the, that from among all the quarries of Gektepe, only Geo 3C contains epigraphic evidence of a religious nature. And now I will pass the floor to Pablo. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dagmara. Uh, this was excellent. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I will take over from here and we'll uh, move on to the actual inscriptions. And well, I still remember how Dagmara called me and asked if I would take a look at this graffiti and then come along for the survey. And from the perspective of a person who mm, had mainly worked on uh, textual graffiti before that, it was quite a challenge. Uh, because when we swept through the quarries, we found there are mainly uh, other types of carvings like uh, or scratchings, like uh, things we later called pictorial graffiti. So uh, first we had to design a way to publish and display our finds. And in many cases, editions which you have, uh, they rip off inscriptions from their context. Like they tend to group uh, inscriptions according to their genre, language, or shape. And such artificial divisions totally dissociate uh, text and images. And their interplay is lost, or it is even very difficult to say that there is any interplay at all. We wanted to avoid it. So we came up with this way of publishing our finds as a worldview. It is a format which preserves the links among text and images from one surface and allows us to better understand the context and functioning of these uh, carvings. Uh, and secondly, we also realized that we need to apply consistent terminology uh, because the term graffito is used in a very wide range of meanings by different authors and we definitely need something more precise. So we adopted a division, you can see it here, based on two criteria. That is, first, we divided our finds into rock inscriptions, which are executed with a hammer or chisel, 
and graffiti, which are basically scratched with any sharp or pointed tool. It also saves us the trouble of defining uh, graffiti as informal inscriptions, which often can be wrong. And uh, uh, this division uh, opens uh, different interpretations. Uh, secondly, we divided, we subdivided graffiti into textual graffiti, figural graffiti, and pictorial graffiti, which form uh, a huge part of, of our collection. And now we have a, a quick tour uh, around uh, the query, starting with uh, a general overview. So we have here six areas. Uh, we um, designated them based on the occurrence of graffiti. So here is area one. Uh, area two, three, four, five, and six. And we number them uh, in the order uh, which is most uh, reasonable for a person entering the query from, from this side and moving downwards to, to the interior of the query. Uh, some of the pictorial graffiti from areas two and three, you can see here and here, were previously published by the earlier surveyors uh, Donata Atanasia, Matthias Bruno, and uh, Ali Bahadiri Yavuz. And they also offered uh, basic transcriptions of one rock inscription and one textual graffito from uh, area one uh, and uh, from uh, area two. It is possible that uh, some of our rock inscriptions uh, from area two and six, uh, right, two and six, uh, were also recorded by them, but they are, but these texts are only mentioned very briefly in their work. So let's move on to area one. Uh, as you can see, this is a flat surface. Uh, uh, it's part of the northeastern rock face, uh, and we have here just one rock inscription uh, whose letter height is about 5.5 centimeters. This, this is the sequence of letter Omicron Ni Ita which are deep and clear and uh, carved with a ligature uh, for the last two letters, ni and ita. Uh, this text was known, as I said, it was published by Atanasia and his team. And they suggested that this is a kind of an acronym and we came up with an idea that this must be an abbreviated name and we perhaps uh, can identify the name of the, the, this person who is mentioned here. Uh, there are different opportunities, there are different possibilities to uh, uh, expand this name, uh, but uh, the most probable, probable one is that this is a certain Onesimus. There are other possibilities, but the name Onesimus was by far the most popular in Caria, as documented by uh, the lexicon of Greek personal names. We have seven occurrences at Aphrodisia, five at Stratonikeia, and 52 in the entire region. So it's uh, the dominating name which begins with this sequence of letters. Um, and other quarries provided with parallels for such uh, signs, like this one uh, from uh, the Mandira region in Proconesos, uh, where we have the letters alpha, epsilon, and phi uh, inscribed on a rock face. And this is almost certainly uh, the name, an abbreviated name, Aufidios. However, we realized how important this find is only uh, when we were browsing through similar markings on the stone slabs from Aphrodisias, uh, which Angelos Haniotis kindly shared with us before their publication in a forthcoming volume of the Aphrodisias papers, The Place of Palms. Uh, such markings occur in three areas of the city, uh, in the Plains of Palms, at the Tetrastone, and in the North Avenue. And among them, one finds combinations of another marking consisting of three letters ale, e, alpha, lambda, eta. You can see it here. It's not very deeply carved, but you can still see it in the photograph, uh, which is presumably Alexandros, uh, which stands for Alexandros, followed by uh, a variety of other markings. And here you have a marking very similar to ours. And Haniotti suggested that these markings uh, may uh, designate owner of the workshop or the lease holder of the quarry and masons or team leaders, including one Onesimus. So it is extremely tempting to associate our mark with that from Aphrodisias, 
If it denotes the same person, it could mean that the stone masons of Aphrodisias intended to source marble from Gectepe for the city, and our inscription may be roughly contemporary with the refurbishment of the Tetra stone in the 360s. This is, however, just a hypothesis, since the two marks have uh, slightly different shapes. Uh, that is, the one from Aphrodisias lacks the ligature, and you can see that Omicron is executed in a very different way. It's almost a perfect circle in Aphrodisias, while here we have rather crude four strokes, uh, perpendicular strokes, making it more of a square than a circle, but still uh, it doesn't change the fact that this is Omicron and we can read it as Onesimus. But yeah, uh, this is just a suggestion that these two markings can be connected. Now we can jump to area two, and here we have uh, southern rock face uh, of the same wall where area one is located. Uh, we have here one textual graffito which we mark TG1 and three pictorial graffiti. And in the middle, there are horizontal traces from a pickaxe, uh, which were certainly made by the uh, uh, artisans working in this quarry. Uh, but uh, as you can see, those carvings, those crosses, and the invocation, the, the textual graffiti, they are surrounding those pickaxe marks. So they, see, they must be later, they must belong to a later uh, uh, time. Mm. So the textual graffiti is nothing really special. It's an invocation with the use of uh, nomina sacra, curia uh, Jesu, O Lord Jesus, and uh, probably the, 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 the person who made this graffito uh, wanted to invoke uh, the help of Jesus. Uh, so normally this would be followed by the uh, by the verb boethe, help, but it, it doesn't happen. It didn't happen here. We've got parallels for such invocations everywhere. For example, this is a case from La, the temple of Hecate, Lagina, where Christians later adopted this site and covered it with uh, their own graffiti. You can see the similar invocation is inscribed on the steps uh, of the Crepidoma here. Uh, now, pictorial graffiti. So we've got uh, three crosses, uh, PG1, about 17 centimeters high staurogram. That is a combination of the letter stau and rho forming a cross uh, with the loop on the letter rho unusually pointed to the left. Uh, the left hand end of the horizontal arm expands into a triangle. It's, yeah, it's visible in this photograph. Then we've got PG2, which is 24 centimeters high and it's an inverted Latin cross with all four arms terminating in short perpendicular bars. And the lower part is inscribed within a half circle. And PG3, uh, below and to the left of PG2, uh, it's a middle-sized plain Greek cross within an irregular circle. Uh, it's a popular shape we, which we find uh, elsewhere in Caria and in other regions. Uh, of this, perhaps the most intriguing is the inverted cross. Uh, it may actually be an inverted image of a regular cross super, superimposed by an arch or rainbow rather than a cross with a ribbon or foliage at its feet, which we will see later in this uh, presentation. A very similar but much better executed slender large Latin cross under an arch is shown on a parapet at the Roman baths of Sagalassos. Uh, such a cross graffito is also recorded among the Christian graffiti at the quarries of Dokimeion. Uh, and such depictions may refer to the great golden cross mounted over the pulpit of the Hagia Sophia, uh, which had a golden ciborium or a kind of a baldachim above this cross. It was suggest an interpretation suggested by Josef Roder with a reference to a specific pa uh, passage from the Patria of Constantinople. But uh, it may be also a depiction uh, of a church within a, of a cross within a church, something like a cross naiskas we can term it this way perhaps, uh, or uh, uh, even more remote reference. That is rather also uh, came up with an idea that uh, this can be uh, images of uh, the relics of the true cross because he found similar uh, depictions on the ampulle from the Holy Land. Uh, you can see those exemplars which are now <clears throat> in the collections of Monza and Bobbio in North Italy. 
Uh, but yeah, the, the next of this ampoule will be, be these descriptions. Um, and it's possible that we have here an association of the cross under an arch motif uh, with the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, housing the relics of the true cross, which this image can represent. It's also an, an interpretation such as uh, supported by Joachim uh, Kotsonis in his study of cross reliquaries. Now, area three. This is the southeastern side of a supporting block uh, with uh, three rock faces positioned at different angles to one another. The upper part is reddish with white intrusions, and this area accommodates three pictorial graffiti, that is, all of them are crosses. Uh, PG4, uh, one can describe its shape as a short vertical line crossed by a symmetrical U with curved endings. And this is probably an unfinished cross with a laurel or ribbon. Uh, you can see this is exactly the this, this same shape as you can see here, but this one is complete while this one lacks the upper part, the upper body of the cross. Uh, PG5, this is a Latin, a thin Latin cross with a long lower arm. The horizontal bar and the upper arm terminate with perpendicular bars. The lower arm is in its lower section crossed by an asymmetrical U-shape with extremities curved downwards. A large cross uh, with irregularly expanding endings is our PG, PG6 here. It, um, it's kind of a cross pate uh, whose left hand arm terminates with a V-shaped ornament and the upper one uh, with a perpendicular bar. And this is probably due to the engraver having limited skills as all the arms were designed to be decorated in the same way. From the lower arm spring two foliated antimia, very beautiful ones. We don't have a parallel for them in this query. And this cross uh, bears uh, a similarity to one of the crosses from Dukimeon uh, in terms of the method of execution. So it was made by punching uh, the rock, not by carving oblong uh, lines. But that one uh, lacks those antemia, which we could see in, uh, in the hour cross. Yeah, now in the area four, we have uh, the northeastern rock face of the southern wall of the quarry. So we are moving deeper into the site. We see here two holes for wedges uh, that were made by uh, artisans who were extracting marble, and two graffiti, one figural graffito uh, here and two uh, pictorial graffiti. And uh, this figural graffito, uh, it's a true gem, uh, a standing human figure, possibly a female figure in crude angular lines, probably executed with a chisel. We see clearly marked head contours with limited anatomical features. There may be traces of a, a circular shape around the head. The chest is asymmetrical and protruding to the right. And two curved bars are meant to represent the legs. And this is the only figural graffiti from quarry G of C. Uh, it is difficult to say if it is contemporary with uh, other carvings. Uh, and the identity of the figure is far from being clear. There may be also a small letter M car carved here, but we were unsure if this is a letter or just a, a damaged part of the stone. Uh, as parallels, uh, we can point to the quarries of the Kimeion, uh, which yielded three figural graffiti. The first is the famed Mary of the Kimeion, but it is just a standing figure uh, probably female in the post posture of an orange. It was tentatively interpreted as an image of um, the Virgin Mary, but we can't really say who, who, is, the, who is the person uh, represented here. The second is a crudely uh, executed bust of a, a person uh, crossed out with two bars. And the third one, and, and I really love this depiction, is a very crude image of a man seated on a rock or throne with a codex. Uh, yeah, this person is holding kind of a book uh, here. Uh, it has a disproportionately large neck and bald head, and Joseph Reder suggested two different interpretations. We are divided by a huge chasm. You know, this, this can be, in his opinion, either a mocking image of a supervisor of the quarry, which was done by uh, some uh, workers not really happy about uh, his severity, <laughs> 
or uh, a clumsy, very clumsy depiction uh, showing Christ Pantocrator. Um, uh, this is a tempting hypothesis, although one must know that Christ Pantocrator is unlike here, usually shown with his right hand raised in the gesture of blessing, and this person is ra raising his left hand. A similar figure of an orant uh, with a nimbus is also carved on the bottom of an unfinished sarcophagus, which we encountered uh, uh, during our survey in Proconesus quarries. And it was also accompanied by crosses, which we will show later today. Uh, but we intend to study that collection later this year. Uh, the fact that sarcophagus was uh, left unfinished and the position of the figure and the uh, crosses uh, is aligned with uh, its direction at, at, as it lays now, as when it was uh, actually put on it, one of its sides, uh, suggests that these are not crosses made for the protection of the deceased uh, who were meant to be buried there. Actually, this sarcophagus never reached any, uh, any uh, cemetery and this do, don't, these don't seem to be uh, prefabricated crosses. Uh, but we can have here a kind of a, um, art of local stone cutters or perhaps other people who are interested in uh, leaving a mark of their own. And it's striking how we, little we know of the artistic needs and habits of these people who carve such texts. And I hope this, will, this gap will be filled in the near future. Uh, but now let's go back to our wall uh, in area four. It also shows uh, two more figural graffiti, uh, an intriguing shape, horizontal oblong shape with uh, its left hand and curved and raised uh, and a faint line protruding uh, in this point. Mm. This is probably an image of a ship or of a ship or a raft or a sledge used for transporting uh, marble. Uh, we can imagine that we have here a kind of a flat bottom boat or a sledge that was used for transporting blocks and rolling timbers, but we can't really be sure what this depiction actually shows us. And uh, the cross, uh, it consists of two superimposed crosses with no ornamentation uh, of the arms. And this type of cross resembles the so-called patriarchal cross known from coins struck under Justinian II and uh, is common in Middle Byzantine period, for example, on architectural elements, and we see it again in our following slides. Now we are moving to the most intriguing part of our uh, quarry, that is uh, areas five and six. Yeah, the, 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 we are here. And uh, here, the south wall of the quarry reveals a row of uh, interconnected chambers, which Dagmara already showed in a different slide. And these cavities came into being when marble blocks were harvested from the quarry's rock face. And only two such chambers, separated by a dividing uh, supporting wall, contained dense clusters of graffiti mixed with two rock inscriptions. Inside the northeastern chamber, uh, we also see an interesting rock structure uh, resembling a narrow bench with a pillow-like protruding element. And the ceilings uh, in both chambers uh, uh, show evidence of smoke. Um, as I said, we marked graffiti clusters from these two uh, chambers, area five and area six. And we can first take a look at, at area five. It's a rough uh, gray brownish surface with several hollows. Uh, uh, it is located immediately to the right of the niche with a bench. Uh, and this area accommodates one rock inscription and at least uh, six pictorial graffiti. We counted uh, six, but uh, well, we are not sure about this uh, shape here, if this is a gra intended graffiti or a damaged rock, but we'll take a look at this later. Let's start with the inscription. Yeah. Uh, so lines one, two of this inscription um, are written above a large elliptical hollowed shape, which is uh, also resulting from the use of a wedge by uh, uh, artisans extracting stone blocks. And this graffito was certainly added later to accommodate the space on top on, and below this uh, hollowing. Uh, the overall height of this text field is 22 centimeters. And uh, 
Uh, the readings in the lower part are not clear, but it is certain that we have here a very common invocation of God or Jesus as the Lord, followed by the names of the supplicants. So it's quite clear that lines one and two read Kyrie Boithi and Tois Duloisu, that is, Lord, help your servants. Uh, in line two, one sigma is clearly missing from the phrase Duloisu, and this haplography results from the placement of the two identical consonants next to each other. So it also shows that these people, the people who made this inscription, they are more familiar with spoken Greek with, with the written uh, variant of this language. And the middle lines must have contained names of these supplicants. It's difficult to decipher them today, but they were uh, given in the dative case. And uh, then in line six, seven follow, probably there follows a mention of Akathoi, Adelphoi, the good brethren, and the last line contains the letters alpha and omega. Uh, the same wall also builds, uh, sorry. In addition, we have here seven pictorial graffiti, that is crosses measuring 10 to 12 centimeters, a plain cross in an oblique position, that is PG9, a cross with almost equal vertical arms with loops and medallions, PG10, uh, an unfinished cross with medallions or loops, that is PG11, a small cross with perpendicular bars uh, with uh, uh, decorating its arms, uh, PG-12, one more cross with loops or medallions, large and impressive uh, mm, cross, that is PG-13, and uh, another occurrence of the so-called patriarchal cross uh, with no, no Roman ornamentation of its arms, that is PG-14. And finally, there is a shape which we were not uh, able to identify. I mentioned it before, it's here. And certainly we've got interesting parallels for these types of crosses. Uh, uh, you can see that we have here a bunch of crosses with uh, triangular endings of circular endings, some of them unfinished, like this one. Uh, uh, these crosses seem to imitate uh, the shape uh, of a cross with globular ends, uh, popular in Byzantine art. And close parallels are provided by depictions of crosses from the inside, for example, of the Stauroteca, like the early 9th century Fieschi Morgan Stauroteca, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts. But we can also find similar crosses elsewhere, like here in uh, Lagina. Again, this is uh, a cross which looks almost exactly like the one we have here. Now, the cross with bars uh, at the end of each arm is well known from coins of the fifth century uh, and much later coin finds. Uh, it is very well represented the, at least the early 10th century. It also appears commonly in Stratonikaya and Lagina, and you also see here examples, uh, for example, on the walls of the Bulauterion and again in the temple of Hecate, you can see here that uh, we had we have very similar uh, carvings, which share this design of perpendicular bars. Uh, now, uh, we are moving to area six. It's the western rock face of the same wall where area five is located, and it accommodates a rough gray brownish surface with several hollows and layers of rock flaking off. Uh, it's a pity that, the, that this rock is actually flaking off here because we couldn't record the whole textual graffito because of the, the mm, damage that has been done to the rock face. Mm. Uh, yeah, the upper part of the wall and the sailing is covered with soot, but uh, since you can see modern traces of modern bonfires in, the, uh, in this chamber, it's difficult to say uh, if this is ancient suit or a modern one, and we didn't, uh, we had no opportunity to examine it during our survey. Here we encountered one rock inscription and several pictorial graffiti. Uh, and quite interestingly, we also see here uh, in the upper part 20 or 21st century uh, graffiti of uh, uh, young people visiting this site and, and um, expressing their emotion for this uh, way. And it's also um, uh, 
proof, another proof for the well-known fact that graffiti tend to uh, aggregate, tend to attract uh, other graffiti makers, so they uh, can actually uh, testify to the very long duration of the practice of making graffiti across uh, uh, a very diachronic uh, uh, phenomenon. So let's move on to the text. The preserved fragment of the rock inscription is about 13 centimeters high and it's located immediately to a rather sophisticated image of a cross, which we'll show in a few minutes. Uh, but sadly, part of the surface flaked off uh, and we can restore most of the text um, uh, with better certainty than in the case of the former graffito. And this is an invocation of the God of St. George on behalf of at, last, of at least two people described as his servants. Uh, invocations of the God of a specific saint are common throughout Mediterranean and such prayers were patterned on the biblical designation of God as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, which you can find, which you can find for example, in Exodus book three, verse 15. They usually indicate a local devotion to the saint rather than God himself. Um, and it is difficult to point to a fixed place of the cult of St. George in Caria. He's mentioned in prayers, for example, in Melassa and appears in wall paintings, uh, for example, at the island of Kuchuk Tavshan near Halikarnasov, but we cannot point to any specific major church or sanctuary that would be a recognizable religious center of St. George. It is, however, not very surprising because George was one of the most popular Byzantine saints and different forms of his cult are overwhel overwhelmingly present in Asia Minor from the sixth century onwards. Uh, so he was apparently chosen uh, by, as a, the addressee of this invocation as uh, one of the most popular saints of his time. Uh, the same wall also yielded seven pictorial graffiti, that is crosses. And we can now briefly review uh, the parallels for the most interesting shapes from the crosses, which you can see here. Uh, that is, for example, we have here uh, crosses with triangles at the end of the arms, open and closed. Like this one here is an open triangle and these are closed, quite irregular. Uh, but we find, we find parallels at Stratonikeia, at Sagalassos on the columns of north-south colonnaded street and on other pieces of sculpture of the early and middle Byzantine period. We also encountered a very similar uh, design of crosses in, inside this unfinished sarcophagus, which, which I showed before. You can see here that this shape is almost identical to this one, except that it also has inner bars uh, within these triangles, while this one is empty. Oh, yeah, this uh, endings uh, don't, don't have any filling here. So, uh, yeah, but we intend to do uh, more research on this collection uh, later this year. Mm. The cross on a pole is a very interesting case uh, of a graffito pattern on a real processional cross. Uh, processional crosses formed an important part of the spectacle of the manifestation of Christian identity and were often held to celebrate important events as well as to secure public space against evil powers. Uh, therefore, they could be easily associated with uh, mm, uh, the right of uh, puring uh, or purifying a specific space and gain prominence as symbols to be inscribed on various surfaces, including architectural elements and tombstones. And we find interesting parallels. This is a magnificent case of a graffito imitating an actual object, a processional cross, which we find in Sagalassos uh, um, in the western portico of the lower Agora. But you can also find them uh, preserved, actually. This is a preserved case of a Byzantine processional cross now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can see how these uh, images uh, try to imitate the actual object. Uh, the most elaborate cross on this uh, wall is, however, this one. Uh, 
It closely corresponds to type two process as classified by Brigitte Spiterakis in her uh, uh, classification of reliquary process. Mm. And Pitarakis and Kotsonis point out that this uh, cross may also be described in the Patria of the Constantinople as a silver plated cross with spherical apples, uh, uh, apples at the pointed corners. This was a silver cross from the form of Constantine in Constantinople, dating probably from the reign of Theodosius I, but later uh, believed to have been the cross of Constantine. Uh, Pitarakis also notes that cross with the flaring arms and knobs or apples at its ends, uh, at the ends of each arm, was a widely known shape and can be seen at various sanctuaries, for example, at St. Catherine's Monastery at Mount Sinai, at Thalamis in Cyprus, among Syrian uh, uh, treasure finds of liturgical vessels and elsewhere. Uh, and Kotsoni sees a similarity again with crosses on pilgrim Ampule from Jerusalem. Uh, which uh, probably denote the reliquary of the true cross and from the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. In Western Asia Minor, we have parallels. Uh, one is provided, for example, by an image of the processional cross engraved on the wall of the cella of the Temple of Zeus at Aizanoi. Uh, both crosses share a similar shape of circular finals and a careful sculptural handling. The Göktepe example is missing, however, the cuneiform lower section designated to embed the cross in its base or handle. Uh, the present cross is more slender and more elegant than that of Aizanoi, which has four almost equally long arms. And Sagalassos offers us also two similar images of crosses, one standing on an orb with knobs uh, at the end of its flaring arms. Yeah. And, mm, another with widely flaring arms, but lacking knobs on a game board. And you can also see here a case of this cross being used on a coin of uh, Olibrios, uh, uh, which is uh, dated to the short period of his reign in AD 472. So it's actually a well dated case that this uh, cross was in use already in the uh, later fifth century. And now, yeah, slowly coming to the end of this talk, we can uh, look at conclusions which we can offer from our collection. So the first one is uh, uh, that uh, the graffito, the, the rock inscription with the uh, stonemason's mark uh, Onesimos, if we are correct in expanding this uh, uh, abbreviation as exactly this name, uh, may point to uh, some links with uh, building activities in aphrodisias, though this is still a very hypothetical, very tentative connection. But if so, it would give us, uh, it would confirm the supposition that the quarries were still active, at least at late, as late as the 360s, though uh, the original team which served it posted the date even slightly earlier. They, they suggested that the quarries were abandoned in the fifth century. Uh, then uh, we should see how these crosses uh, are uh, centered in just two chambers. They don't appear anywhere else in Quar Geo, Geo C or in other quarries of Gektepe. And in the Kimeian, they are more or less evenly spread. So here the question is why they would appear in just two uh, exploited quarry chambers. Uh, because there have been suggestions that such crosses can be made by uh, artisans who uh, extract the stone and uh, some of them make it uh, to make their work easier, to profess their faith or to uh, protect the stone from accidental damage. Uh, but it appears that uh, since these uh, finds are limited to just two quarry chambers, we can expect that they, they come from a later period of the settlement uh, of occupation of this quarry, uh, which could uh, actually uh, be started by monks, probably no earlier than in the late 6th or 7th century. We judge so based on the shape of crosses, but even more on the invocation of St. George, which is unlikely to occur before the early 6th century. Actually, the earliest dated inscription uh, attesting to St. George is, uh, well, it comes from um, 
The Near East and from Zarava is and is about uh, dated to about 520s as far as I remember. Mm. We wouldn't certainly we wouldn't expect invocation of St. George as early as 360s. So these monks are probably be building a kind of a safety perimeter because they believe they were exposed to demons or evil powers in such a remote place and wanted to protect themselves. Uh, which I think which is extremely important is that, did that these crosses, the designs of these crosses are not invented. They are actual imitations of widely circulating shapes of crosses, some of them connected to precious objects decorated with gems or ritual liturgical objects like processional crosses. So we have here a community well informed about shapes and function of crosses, though it can be an extremely small community, like let's say two or three hermits who are mentioned in our rock inscription too. So thank you for this, uh, for the opportunity to uh, present today. Thank you very, very much, Paola and Dagmara. Thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation, both of the project as a whole and of these very specific uh, rock inscriptions and graffiti. Um, there are a number of um, questions that are ready in the Q and A box. I do encourage any of our participants who've got any questions for our speakers to type them into the Q and A. If you type them into the chat, I will not necessarily uh, see them. We have some thank yous coming in um, in the chat box um, for people who appreciated this talk. Um, personally, I really enjoyed seeing these, uh, so many of these in color, um, because of course, when we had to print, we had to print this article in black and white. So it is lovely to see um, the texture that you can see from proper color images. Right, um, that first question comes from Gulsum, who asks that if Guktepa was discovered in the southeast part of Anatolia, um, are there extensions of this in Karia or Mula? Um, I assume this means, um, I assume this means, um, this is a question about how far Guktepa marble might have circulated. That sounds like this is what it's about. Um, so perhaps that's a good place to start. Yeah. Yeah, or it may be a question about if, if we have parallel uh, queries, similar queries to this one, which if we can come across similar sites in this region, and maybe Dagmara will uh, answer. Yes, she did. We, yeah, well, this is very, very interesting question. We um, we have similar, similar, not similar queries, but we have queries in Hilarima, for example, that were used locally. And uh, I think whole area should be investigated more to find some other quarries because uh, from geological point of view, um, this area is very, very rich, whole area. So, but we didn't investigate it more places. So I don't know if it is a good answer for the question. If I understood correctly, that was the question. Yeah. I think it does open up um, a whole area of research which you are moving into very kind of bravely in the years um, ahead. And, and that is how um, the landscape is used, the re how regional resources are used. And I think it's so important. We often, yeah. as archaeologists, see one quarry here yes. and then you know a couple of hundred miles away and another quarry there. And actually, there are a lot of these micro quarries and where are they used and how is the stone distributed and the practicalities of moving the stone around. Sometimes we just don't see that unless we investigate the whole quarry landscape, we're going to miss. Yes. It, the problem uh, is that the whole area is deeply, uh, there is a very deep vegetation. So this is also um, quite difficult. Uh, we visited various sites. We visited Kis, Pinebion, and we found uh, marble that probably was quarried somewhere close to Göktepe, uh, but we didn't find the quarries. We didn't search these quarries, honestly. So I think um, that should be done in the future, absolutely. All area close to Mobola, uh, Mula, it's very, very interesting and, uh, and unknown. Yeah. So, absolutely. Um, 
Going on to the next question from Mesut, who asks, I wonder if there are any graffiti of artists, like sculptures or glassmakers, similar to those of Aphrodisias. In Aphrodisias, there are many sarcophagi with sculpted um, work, simple artwork of the artists. But that means if we found something in the quarries? No, I think it's more general. That general. Open if, up. If there are, well, this is also very, very, very interesting question. We have artifacts uh, analyzed by uh, Donato Atanasio, Matthias Bruno, and uh, Ali Bahadir Yavuz, and they were um, recognized as made of marble from Goethe. So not sarcophagi, but fine, fine card sculptures, portraits, and, and uh, many portraits. So they were archaeometrically investigated. Um, yeah, well, this is another topic and another discussion, discussion, discussion from another paper, I would say, which is extremely, extremely interesting, uh, I think. So. Well, yes, but actually it's twofold because you can make of it a more general question about signature of artisans, which we have, and they need not to take the shape of graffiti. Like we have lots of cases where uh, artisans workshops sign their work on the, for example, the tombstone. Uh, like we have a set of, uh, a very famous set of Christian epitaph dating from the mid third century with uh, a designation of a workshop naming themselves Christians for Christians, that it was kind of an advertisement put on each epitaph. Uh, that intended to lure Christian audience or Christian customers to exactly this workshop because it said that these are uh, tombstones made by people who know the job. They know how to make Christian epitaphs because they are Christians and they should come here. And it's quite interesting that they are dated and they come from the first, late first, mid and late first century. That is well before uh, Constantine. <laughs> Um, but you, but well, we also find mosaics signatures, which also appear in this way uh, on mosaics on mosaics in the uh, in the uh, Near East. And uh, we also have a quite interesting case of uh, artisans uh, uh, marking the stones in one of hagiographical texts. It, it is also a text which often uh, finds its way to. Uh, people studying quarries and uh, extraction of marble in late antiquity, because it's uh, the martyrdom of the Quattro Coronati, that is a group of Roman martyrs, and who uh, are described as, by the hagiographer as people who um, made the sign of the cross above, the to above each stone block before they extracted it. It's not clear if they carved it or just made the gesture. It's, not really easy to judge based on the description, but uh, it was used uh, as a basis for the supposition that Christian uh, that Christian stone cutters could use such practice that they were putting kind of an apotropaic tech, uh, mark of the cross. They understood cross as an apotropaic marking that could be put on the stone slab, and uh, and we probably have examples of this practice in the Kimeion, but. We believe that this is not the case of Gektepe because if so, then these uh, crosses would be evenly spread in other parts, and here they are just in one place. But, yeah, but yes, we very often find a number of uh, references uh, to, to people who made a sculpture or a stone block, carved an inscription, and uh, we still need to do more research on this. <laughs> Can I can I stick with that for a little bit longer? This idea of of leaving your mark and the idea of sculptors or masons who are leaving their mark for posterity or in some kind of way. So I, I'm I'm I love the idea of the Onesimos, and I think it'd be wonderful if that can be linked. This is the the, the overseer or the stonemason. I think that that is perfect and beautiful. But I do wonder if your crosses might be something. Similar, you have um, you have the Agathoi at Adelphoi, and the idea of maybe these are individuals each leaving their cross, and it just put me in mind of some of the Paleolithic caves that you have, where you have handprints, and the theory being that people left a handprint as their um, as their mark, um, and uh, 
could we have a situation where leaving a cross or carving a cross in your own style becomes your mark that you leave? Well, it's possible, Dagmar. What do you think? Because uh, we can imagine that one person who can write actually makes the inscription on behalf of the whole group or the brotherhood yeah, or the, the, the people who inhabited this quarry and then everyone makes this uh, image of a cross as a mm, kind of a mm, uh, a symbolic representation of uh, this person but uh, this is speculation yeah, this, this is, is speculation you can't really say yeah. in, in that case we could expect names you know that could be uh, listed on the wall perhaps but uh, yeah 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 but you know it, it's really it's really impressive when you enter those chambers and you take a look at these crosses they they are in front of you they surround you and they also take some space of the sailing, so they are also on top of you. And they really create some of a 3D protective dome for the person who is inside there. And we, we have enough of hagiographical accounts of monks being cursed by demons and, and uh, ethereal entities that can uh, let us uh, suppose that those people were afraid of similar things and wanted to sleep, for example, under kind of uh, under, under a similar uh, protective dome. So maybe this is, uh, this would explain better that they are um, crosses made in a single act to create a safe religious space for the people who inhabited those, this quarry. But, Dagmara, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we discussed this, but we don't know. The interesting is that only in one quarry we have these crosses, so. This must be so significant. That is significant. We, we have a group. Well, yeah. We have a, a much less speculative question from Alan, who asks, why are the inscriptions white? Presumably is when you've scratched into the rock, they why do they all look white? Because they were well, they were carved and yeah, there is no patina, there is nothing, but they were also cleaned a little bit to, to, to read better. But of course, some of them, you, you mean the graffiti are, 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 some of them are white because they are not very old, but others are, you can see very well. They, they were probably made in different periods, not in one, one century, let's say, but you have older yeah. earlier probably. Link to that, is there, any trace of paint on any of these? No, we haven't noted. No. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. It could be, of course. No. Some of our images were photoshopped here to make the. Yeah, so they are more white. More distinct, also. so then they can look like a bit <laughs> colorful, but, but this is just to make the uh, mm, carvings sharper and well visible uh, in, in the photographs. Uh, so we, 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 yeah, we used the Photoshop and other techniques to show you better the inscriptions and shape of the crosses. Absolutely, and, and of course that's necessary. We have a question from YouTube. Somebody who's watching on YouTube, AS, um, talks about um, PG21, um, and they suggest that this looks like a woman's face perhaps on the lower part in black. I don't know if you can bring PG up that image 20. first. Yeah, it's yeah. our cross. That's the processional cross. Oh. The processional cross, yeah, exactly. I'm not Did sure. you have a woman's face in the lower part of that? That's interesting. For a while, but... Well, it is certainly a processional cross because yes. uh, it has a pole uh, from which the uh, cross is bringing on top and... Uh, well, the cross may be a bit clumsy. You can but, see that, yeah, these are very, well, these strokes are too long and uh, these arms, uh, well, they, it took some time for the person to make it and, and the, the, the endings are different on the horizontal arms than, and on the vertical arms, but still, uh, yeah, it, it's, it is certainly a processional cross. I'm not sure where the image of the woman's face might no, be not. in the 
black I think the black bit is is that the natural grain of the marble yeah I think so yes 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 okay. absolutely so it wouldn't be really that uh, surprising because we have a lot of uh, images of San Simeon the stylite mainly the older but Simeon the stylite the younger is can also be uh, shown in this way. So he's sitting on top of his pillar and he has his hands stretched on both hands. So he's both praying and imitating a cross. And this is a kind of a both depiction of a saint and a, a sophisticated depiction of a cross, uh, which a symbol of a cross perhaps rather than an actual cross. But there we have a person who's, uh, who is actually embedded in the cross. And, I think that's quite a, an interesting oh, ambiguity on. there. Um, Lut asks, the inscriptions and graffiti you showed are Christian symbols, except for the sledge-like one, which you interpret as a tool used while quarrying. Do you think that the latter graffiti was engraved with the quarry um, was still in use, unlike the Christian symbols? Well, we were thinking about possible uh, dating for this wall. And yeah, of course, we can never uh, assume that when we come across a collection of inscriptions, even if they are simple dedicatory inscription in the floor of a church or uh, a public building or so, uh, they come from the same time and they are contemporary to each other. So this we should always take into consideration this possibility. And uh, well, uh, it's difficult to say. We really don't have much uh, instruments to judge it. Uh, if this is uh, contemporary to 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 the, to the crosses, if this strange image is contemporary to the car to other carvings from the, from this uh, quarry. But uh, well, my impression was that uh, it may be earlier because we would expect uh, artisans working in this quarry to make uh, images uh, to to make images of instruments of the, their daily work. And in that case, we would have parts of, uh, well, some images can come from an earlier period when the quarry was still active, while others were added later when it was resettled, would supposedly resettled. Yeah, because we, we are not sure, we only uh, assume that it was uh, later resettled and this process come from uh, inhabitants who came uh, perhaps a century or two after the quarry was abandoned. But, uh, but yeah. The, the, also, the, uh, also the image of the female figure is yeah. not sure. It, it was probably carved uh, together with Lech before, before the Christians arrived, probably. But we don't know. It, 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 it looks like a like figure of, of Aphrodite. Uh, at the first glance, when I look at it, very similar to to a female figure, not necessarily Mary, but maybe. Interesting. When when I first saw it, I had in mind um, the here. images of um, um, Aeneas fleeing Troy. Um, okay. You know those really stat, and he has his also, legs yes, wide apart, and yeah. so the stance of the legs really made me think about um, Aeneas. And I was wondering, as well. Um, sorry, I'm getting carried away talking about this. That um, it, this person, I wondered if it, do they look like they're carrying something in front of them? Um, and initially, mm -hmm. I thought it might look like a, a little a child, a child in a in a robe with little feet. But this might just be me seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking, thinking if yeah. this is actually a complete and finished uh, and finished image because yeah it does seem like a person who is carrying something and you can see an elbow here yeah right yeah, so we thought about Mary and the child yeah and then, like, <laughs> so yeah it's a wild guess but you know it can be supported by this letter M if it's really a yeah, letter if M, it is but, M <laughs> perhaps so, our fantasy you know only but speculation. we can also wonder if this is an unfinished image like the one of an orant uh, whose arms have not been carved in, and uh, this would make things much easier for our for the interpretation or it is a simplified image just yeah. simplified outline of the human figure but yeah it's difficult yeah we have another question and come uh, yeah, come across from youtube from alex 
who says, could you please talk a little bit more about the meaning and the function of the, those loops and triangles which occur at the ends of crosses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so these are decorative elements which we often find in uh, inscriptions in uh, Anatolia, Syria, Palestine, uh, mainland Greece, so... Uh, as we try to show, uh, they imitate uh, kind of this type of decoration, which is normally associated with crosses in works of high Byzantine art. So they, uh, people who made these images, they, they tried to imitate what they saw in churches, for example, or even in some significant pilgrimage sanctuaries, like perhaps in Ephesus in the church of St. John, where someone could find really astonishing pieces of uh, uh, artist here because this was one of the most important sanctuaries of Asia Minor and it certainly attracted pilgrims and enjoyed a, a, a very generous uh, donation from Justinian. So uh, we can be sure that it also abounded in uh, liturgical object censors decorated with crosses, processional crosses and so on that, that could be observed by people living in the area and perhaps going there on pilgrimage, but actually any cross, any any church could could house such objects, and uh, you know when you have a plain type of a cross, then you try to uh, make it more ornament, and this is natural that you want to make something more beautiful in your environment, and uh, then there is a limited number of uh, options uh, of things you, you can make with a cross to make it more decorative, and probably the most intuitive one is to make. Uh, uh, the arms spread or fit the arms with uh, some globes or kind of apples. You know, we've got here two-dimensional images, but you should remember that they imitate three-dimensional objects. So these are not mm. just circles. This, this can be globes and uh, other objects. It's really interesting, the, the hypothesis that these people who made those crosses had in mind a peculiar cross, like for example, uh, the reliquary of the true cross from Jerusalem may be uh, interesting. We, it's again a guess. We 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 have no uh, evidence to support this, but uh, but still, uh, it would be something that people of that time thought of. Yeah, that the, the, this most holy piece, uh, the, the, the 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 most holy relic uh, of the cross that was believed to have been exactly the same cross on which Jesus died and was uh, found during Constantine's reign and then was promoted to in the empire. So maybe maybe they have it in mind and they know people who went to pilgrimage and described how it looked like or maybe local designs of crosses imitate this, uh, this uh, design. But yeah, these are mainly decorative elements, yeah, as I said, that sometimes containing images of plants, like this round. Yeah, they, this can be, med they can contain medallions with images. Medallions. Of plants, for so. Yeah, like the one, the processional cross from the Metropolitan Museum, which uh, we showed you. Uh, I think you can still hear, see my presentation. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's got medallions yes. with yes, uh, busts yeah uh, so uh, this space is used to uh, display further religious message yeah it can refer to cults of specific saints for example or display jesus and uh, and uh, then it becomes uh, a multi-layered message it's not just a cross but it's deeply involved also with the cult of saints local uh, devotion to one or another saint or so and I think what's exciting about this um, particular site is that you're not getting the golden processional cross. This is somebody's interpretation of it in a very humble, modest way, scratched into a cave, as you said, not very, not in the middle of bustling metropolis, but far away from anywhere. And I think it's um, it's really important that we we see these how iconography travels through different levels of society and gets reused. Um, in different ways, but there are, of course, um, ambiguities. I think we are getting close to the end of today's session. If there are any final questions, please do type them in the Q&A box now. I have got one last final question um, for Powell and, and Dagmara, actually, and that was, you mentioned earlier on that 
some of these quarries are under uh, are still being used or are being reworked or are being acquired again and are, 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 could there be more things like this out there which we have lost or which we are going to lose in the next few years because we simply don't know they're there and they're going to end up being cut away or used well, I think so, unfortunately. Uh, I think we, we are losing a lot of evidence because um, the marble is quarried in very, very extensive way. Um, so even close to, to these quarries, to these quarries that we investigated are, are newly opened quarries of, of, of marble. So, and even Gaktepe, Gaktepe is disappearing now. So our, our documentation, I think it's very, very important from this point of view. Um, and also other quarries in other regions, also the Kimeon, Proclamezos, of course, um, and the quarries around Aphrodisias, in the region of Aphrodisias. So it's, it's how it's going with quarries. Which is why one of the reasons why this work is really so important. We should, I do. Yeah, yeah so we, we should work hard and quickly to document all remains, such as in Gektepe. Yeah, you know, because when a modern quarry company wants to extract marble, they have to, they have to find a site, and the easiest way is to go to well-tested sites. That's yes. Have been places where marble have been extracted for generations, sometimes yeah. thousands of years. And so they go for ancient sites and then they try to dig, if not exactly at precisely the site where uh, marble was extracted in antiquity, then very close. And of course, the site is damaged and it happens throughout the Mediterranean. It's not specific of any. Of course, region. everywhere. But it's normal, uh, um, I think. That old quarries are disappearing. <laughs> yeah, but our project also served Aphrodisias and uh, Dagmara has an, uh, yeah, a number of database of samples from uh, from those marbles. So hope yes. they will do the job even if this quarry disappears. And, if, yeah, and so more, the and, yeah, we and will put more, it online. Yeah, on the, uh, yes, on the yes, website. Yes, of course. Yes, they, yeah, are, because the they website are already online. Also, and uh, more, it's online, but it will be uh, extended if it will be fitted yes. with uh, uh, new uh, features with new yes. content uh, over the next months. And yes, the, the, the important is that we, we have 3D models of the quarries that are disappearing now. So this is really important. Also, the quarries, uh, we are talking about Gektepe. So the quarry of white marble, quite nice quarry, uh, G of, G of 4 your 3D, I think, uh, it's lost now. And, uh, and it was quarried in antiquity, in modern time, and again in modern time, long time. And um, yeah, these are examples of, of the 3D models. Yeah, the scanning team did a marvelous job. So we have every single quarry document. You can move the image, image, of course. You can move the image, yeah, you can rotate it, you can uh, zoom it, and yes. then you feel like uh, you move through the quarry. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I really would advise um, everyone to have a look at this website. I've just pasted the link again in the chat. So please, please copy that um, before, before we finish. Um, on that note, I think it is time for us to bid a farewell. Um, thank you very much, Dagmara. Thank you very much, Powell. And thank you to all of our attendees who have asked questions and uh, made comments and uh, been with us this evening. We hope to see you all again after the summer. Have a lovely